Good evening, everyone. Hate to break up good conversations, but I promise there will be more opportunities for good conversations. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chad Williams. Um, I'm a professor of African American Studies and History at Brandeis University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our third and final session of the Connections, Cops, and Community series. Thank you for being here in person, and also welcome to everybody who is on Zoom. Uh, I want to thank all of the supporters and organizers of this series, uh, especially Katie King for her organizational brilliance. Round of applause, please. So in our first event, we talked about the history of policing in the United States and here in Needham. Last month, we explored the role and impact of school resource officers, again, from a national and local perspective. These conversations, and especially our conversation this evening, cannot be more timely and, dare I say, urgent. Who would have possibly imagined that soon after our event last month, focused on the presence of police in our schools, one of the worst school shootings in American history would have taken place. This was on the one hand a tragedy, excuse me, tragedy beyond comprehension, while on the other hand, tragically predictable. In a nation awash in guns, seeped in a history and culture of violence, what took place in Uvalde is not an anomaly. In our suburban world of Needham, Massachusetts, it's easy to feel insulated and isolated from the world around us. But for any of us who had to take our children to school the day after the Evaldi shooting, myself included, and hugged our kids a little bit tighter that morning as we said goodbye, we know that what happens in other places and to other people impacts us all. The Valdi shooting also visibly, vividly reminds us about the importance of the police in our communities. When it comes to our safety, law enforcement is on the front lines and selflessly put their safety and lives at risk. But as the questions continue to swirl about the actions of the police in Uvalde, we also see why consistent, open dialogue is so imperative, as is transparency. So today we're going to focus on two-way communication and understanding between the Needham community and our police department. We hope that over the long term, these types of conversations will lead to increasing levels of trust and continued conversations. It cannot end tonight. M. Quentin Williams will lead us through our program this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. Mr. Williams is the founder and CEO of Dedication to Community, the national nonprofit he established in 2012. Quinton's career in law, professional sports, and leadership consulting culminates in D2C, which delivers skills building workshops and ongoing forums to improve understanding and build relationships in communities through healing, reconciliation, and unity. D2C experts work with government agencies and the private sector on diversity, belonging, and equity, and advise on critical issues in public safety and law enforcement. In addition to leading D2C and law enforcement training for agencies across the United States, Williams has been an instructor at the FBI National Academy and a member of the Law Enforcement Education and Training Council at the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Quinton earned his JD from St. John's University School of Law, where he is an executive com committee member of the Ronald H. Brown Center for Civil Rights. He holds a bachelor's in economics from Boston College, which he attended on a football scholarship. So please join me in welcoming Mr. M. Q. Williams. Thank you, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me well? Thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I'm honored to be here and honored to stand before such a, a great audience. 
I am Quentin Williams. I'm from Dedication to Community. It's an organization that was created to educate society about justice. We started with economic justice. We're trying to get people to understand that they can reach their dreams if they live in a certain way and if they build relationships in a certain way to increase those odds. And then we expanded out to include criminal, procedural, and social justice. We spend a lot of time educating folks and facilitating conversations about how to build better relationships. And I want to just say thank you to the law enforcement officers. You don't get that much. Put a vest on every morning to protect and serve people who you might not even know. So thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. I appreciate it. It was, uh, it was in 1994 when I was in my office in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I was, I was at my office, it was during, during the summer of 1994, it was at about 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday, and um, I was getting ready to go to my summer home. My summer home, if you know something about my background, you might giggle when I say my summer home, because when I was a kid, we didn't even go on vacation. So having a summer home was something pretty new to me. But here I was, a young 20-something-year-old professional, and I finally had a little bit of money, and my friends, my colleagues at work, they approached me one day, and they said, yo, Q, why don't you just get in on this rental that we, we do? Every year, we go up to Newport, Rhode Island. Very familiar with Newport here, right? We go to Newport, Rhode Island. We rent a house, and it's the best time. We, we go there every weekend during the summer. And my first question, because I didn't even know anything about Newport, I didn't know where it was or anything, but my first question was, how much? They told me. It was inexpensive. I was like, I'm in on this day, this summer day, this Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. I make my way up to Newport, get in my car to a two and a half hour uh, drive right from Bridgeport, straight shot on I-95. I get to the bridge and you know the the way it is in Newport, how picturesque it is. Gorgeous. I pay my toll on that day. I go to my summer home, and it was only a couple minutes from the bridge. I, I'm in a suit, so I change out of my suit. I put on some jeans, T-shirt, sneakers. I'm going to this party. My friends, my housemates, my colleagues, they're at this party. I've been waiting all week for this party. I could only think about the party on that two-and-a-half-hour drive. I make my way down toward Thames. Thames, you know, is the main thoroughfare. I take a left on Thames, and it's crowded. Height of tourist season, so, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people are on the street. I make that left. I walk about two blocks, and I see a law enforcement officer, a Newport PD officer across the street, so I wave because I always wave at you. I always say, thank you for your service. I have kids who are eight and nine. Now, I'm 56. You do the math. My knees are feeling the math. <laughs> my kids are eight and nine. Ever since they were two, they go up to law enforcement officers and they say, thank you for your service. That's the way we taught them. Sometimes you see the tears in officers' eyes because you don't get that much. So I said, thank you for your service from across the street. After waving at him, I said, be careful out here. It's a little deceiving. It's dangerous because there are some drunks on the street, as you know Newport has. And he said, oh, yeah, come on over. I said, well, OK. So I walked across the street to greet him. And I'm chatting him up as I'm approaching him. About six seconds into it, he says, yeah, I want you to do something for me. He said, I want you to turn around, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest. I was like, I just got here. You have to know my friends, my friends who were my housemates. Like, these dudes are highly intelligent people, really smart, but they're also, and they, they think they're better than they are sometimes, but they, they're really good practical jokers, like the best practical jokers at times. Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, George Clooney have nothing on my friends. You saw the Ocean's 11, 12, 13. Nothing on my friends. So when he said, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest, I'm like, they got me. Like, 
these dudes. But how did they get a Newport PD officer to fake arrest me on a Friday high season in Newport? I said, they're good. But I didn't take a chance. I did what he said to do. I, just in case, I started to turn around with my hands behind my back. And as I did, I saw a sea of blue behind me. Blue lights everywhere. Blue uniforms lining the street. This was no joke. With my hands behind my back, he cuffs me quickly. He puts me up against the cruiser that was behind me, the cruiser that I'd never seen when I crossed the street. I didn't see any of the chaos. There was like half of Newport PD was out there. I didn't see it because I was so focused on this party. It was like tunnel vision. As I'm up against that cruiser, cuffed, I'm stunned, so now, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. So I say to him, I say, officer, could you tell me what's going on? I just got here. And he said, shut up. I said, oh, man. I said, no, really, officer, I just got here. Could somebody out here tell me what's happening? And he said, be quiet. And I said, officer, I just got here, and there's something I have to tell you. I said, officer, I'm an FBI agent, and I have a gun on me. And he said, <laughs> yeah, right. I said, no, 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 really. I'm an FBI agent. I have a gun on me. It's around my waist. My credentials are there, too. I said, um, you can check. I had my, uh, my gun and my credentials in what was then the officers, the old, old school officers might know what this is. It was in what was called a fanny pack. Does anybody remember what that, you still use those? No? You use, oh, you, did, you admit it, you did admit it. I had, I had my credentials in my nine millimeter, my Sig Sauer P226 nine millimeter. It was my bureau, bureau issued weapon in that fanny pack. He said, oh, I'm going to take that from you. He takes it off me. He puts me inside the cruiser where I sat for not minutes, but hours. As one by one, the officers out there rotated through that driver's seat. And when they sit, sat in that seat, they would look back at me with my credentials in their hand sometimes, with a pad in their hand as well. And they would write some notes, and they would check my credentials. A couple of them took my credentials and put them up against the light, turned them upside down. They didn't believe I was an FBI agent. Hey, listen, FBI agents sometimes do some nonsensical stuff. They're not perfect. But me? I just got there. That happened over and over and over and over and over again. Until finally, the guy who was running the show, the lieutenant, I knew he was a lieutenant. He had bars on his collar. He stepped into that seat, and he did the same thing. He wrote some notes. He looked back at me, looked at my credentials. This was my shot. This was my, because I didn't know what was going on. I said to him, Lieutenant, could you possibly tell me what's going on? I just got here. And he said, just give me a minute. When I say that minute felt like an hour, I'm not lying. It may have even felt like a day. It couldn't have been more than 30 seconds, maybe 60. But it felt like it took forever. Because all I could think about was my mother, my queen. My mother is my queen. She's everything to me. My mother sacrificed for my entire childhood to keep me out of cuffs. While my friends were getting eaten by the streets, put behind bars during the height of the crack epidemic, my mother was embracing me and then my brother, who came along six years later with nothing but love. She's going to be heartbroken when she finds out that I'm in the back of a cruiser with cuffs on me. She's such a special person. My mother is special, inside and out, lovely, beautiful, the whole thing. She, um, she, she's had a challenging life, and that challenging life started when she was a kid because she was being abused by somebody in this home that she lived in, which was a really aesthetically pleasing home in Eastchester, New York. I don't know if you're familiar, but in New York, 
where she's from, there are three suburbs, New Jersey, Long Island, and Westchester. In Westchester, there's this town called Eastchester. She lived in Eastchester in a colonial that had yellow shutters, it was white, and there were dogwood trees lining the street. She had, on her block, kids playing all the time. If you go back there now, it looks the same way that it looked 55 years ago. It hasn't changed, it's picturesque. But she was being abused by somebody that lived in that house, so she had to go through that torment from the time she was a young girl through her adolescence, her teen years, and then when she was an adult, she finally said, I'm getting out of here, I'm escaping this. So she got on a plane, got a one-way ticket, didn't have much money. Her parents were middle class, but she didn't have much money, but she found the money to get that one-way plane ticket, and she landed on this island called St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Now, this is in 1965, the height of the Civil Rights Movement. As soon as she got on that plane, she was disowned by her parents because back then, young ladies from that house didn't leave that house unless they were going to school or get, going to college or getting married. Just the way it was, 1964. That was the culture. When she landed, she had all these men who approached her on the island of St. Thomas. They wanted to date her. My mother looked like a Hollywood movie star. So they wanted to date her. And she was escaping stuff, so she didn't want to have anything to do with them. But there was one guy who caught her eye. And this one guy said to her, I got you, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. You have no money, no job, no family, no friends, but don't worry about a thing. I got you. And my mother's this trusting woman, like really trusting. She trusts everybody, face value. She trusted him. She dated him, had a relationship with him, got pregnant by him. I'm the result. My mother's a white Jewish woman. This man, a black Antiguan man. If you think my grandparents were mad before, <laughs> quadruple disowned her. She tells him a month later that she's pregnant and he abandons her. He says, nah, I don't want to be a father. So now she has all these conditions, she has no resources, and she's pregnant with me in her belly, black kid in her belly, disowned by her parents. She doesn't know what she's gonna do, she doesn't know if she's gonna keep me. For two months, she just doesn't know, and then another man approaches her and he says, don't worry about a thing, I got you. I'm gonna take care of you. I'm like, Ma, when she tells me the story for the first time, I'm like, come on, Ma. That's he said, I'm gonna take care of you during the rest of your pregnancy, about six months. I'm, I'm also gonna marry you and then I'm gonna adopt the baby you give birth to because that baby's mine. I love you, I love that baby. Again, I said, Ma, that's a crazy story. Like, you fell for that? She said, I just thought everything would be okay. And the good news is, it was. Dude did everything he said he was gonna do. He took care of her during the six months of her pregnancy. He married her, adopted me, his last name Williams, my last name Williams, he's on my birth certificate, and we're living a life. A month later, my mother gets a knock on her door and it's his wife. Dude was married. He's a bigamist. He was lying. He had another family on the other side of the island. All a lie. My mother's crushed, so she says, that's it. I'm four months old. She takes me back to New York. She's gonna reunite with her, with her parents, but they're not having it. They don't wanna have anything to do with us. So instead of going to East Chester, New York, we go to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 153 Norfolk Street. If you go there now, you'll be like, what are you talking about? It's really nice. Back then, 153 Norfolk Street. I don't know if there are any New Yorkers here or familiar, you are. So, Back then, crime was running rampant. Now, cafes and boutiques and young, it's totally transformed. I saw so much by the time I was three years old, I walked up to my mother and I said, I don't wanna live here anymore. I don't even know how I said it, but this is what she tells me. Like, how did I even articulate that? I'm three. She saves up, figures it out. For the next year, she gets us out of there and we move to Westchester, New York when I'm four years old. My queen did this for us. Well, we moved to Westchester, but we moved to Yonkers. Are you familiar with Yonkers? A little bit different in Westchester. Like, back then, we probably would have been better staying at 153 Norfolk Street. Crime was running rampant there. Uh, poverty, despair, drugs, bad education system, an education system that was being sued by the federal government, 
They had so much going on. Political corruption was, was pretty, HBO has a ser had a series about the political corruption in Yonkers, that's how bad it was. I did all my schooling there, K through 12. When I'm in kindergarten, my mother tells me the story that she's called into Ms. Bedegan's office, uh, classroom. Ms. Bedegan was my kindergarten teacher. Ms. Bedegan sits her down and says, Ms. Williams, I'm sorry to tell you, but your son isn't going to be much in life. I'm five. Like, that's the education system that we had. By the time I'm eight, I figured it out. Something was not right with me. There were some things missing. Like, the way I processed my academics was not like my friends did. And when I was eight years old, I figured out what it was. I'm in the third grade, and my friends are all reading books. I couldn't even read sentences. I have this reading deficit that doesn't allow me to comprehend words unless I focus in a certain way. I had to learn how to do this over the course of decades. I still have it, but I've overcome it because my mother told me I could. My mother told me I could be whatever I wanted to be in life. If I don't concentrate, though, when I'm reading, I'm a third grader, still not understanding when I'm reading. Crack epidemic hits Yonkers when I'm a teenager, and my friends are all doing or selling it, and so are their parents, so they're getting eaten by the streets and getting locked up. And they approach me all the time because we're on welfare, $585 per month, 17 years of my life, first 17 years of my life on welfare. They know I need the money, we need the money, and they approach me and say, yo, man, get in this game. They're making two to $400 per day running for the biggest crack dealers in the Bronx. This is in the 70s. I always said no. I'd rather go hungry than break my mother's heart. I'm getting teased all the time at this point because I'm a scrawny, a scrawny little kid, and I have a white mother raising two black kids in a black neighborhood, so they're calling me names. Every week I'm getting into a fight because they're calling me names. And then when my mother starts picking me up at school, they, they're calling her names now. That's where I draw the line. So I'm fighting every day now because every day she picks me up, they're calling her names. And I'm getting it handed to me. I gotta be honest, I'm a little puny kid, so every day I'm getting beaten up. So I, I have to figure out how I'm going to protect my mother. And so I start to figure out, well, maybe if I lift weights, I'll get bigger, and that's what I do. I lift weights, I get bigger. And as I'm getting bigger, I notice I'm a pretty good athlete. And then I'm a pretty good football player, so I, I start playing football, and I'm, I'm doing well. I do well enough to get a scholarship to go to Boston College. I play with Doug Flutie. You all know who he is. I also pay, play with Carl Creshpain, who's from Needham. Doug Flutie, if you haven't seen him in person, is like 5'7", 140 pounds. He says he's 5'10", 170. I have pictures. <laughs> Doug is the best college football player in the world. He wins a Heisman in front of me. It expands my world because how could he, at that height and weight, be the best college football player in the world? It's because, just like my mother told me, we can be whatever we want to be in life. I, um, I graduated from BC and I go to law school, not because I wanted to, because I had a mentor who was a lawyer and he said, you need to go to law school. I was like, law school, what's that? Like, we didn't have any lawyers on Warburton Avenue in Yonkers, but he was a lawyer. So he said, you need to go. He said, apply. I was like, apply, come on, I'm not gonna, remember, I had the reading condition but I apply, I get in, now I gotta go. I go and I learn how to read really well in law school, I didn't have a choice. I learned that it's a concentration thing where I have to concentrate in a certain way at 100%. While I'm in law school, the FBI comes to law school and they're recruiting and they recruit me. I don't wanna be a cop, my friends are getting put behind bars by cops, so that's not what I want to be. But then I rethought that and said, you know what? I want to be a part of the change. I could sit here and complain or I could maybe help to tweak the system. 
So I become an FBI agent, undercover for two and a half years. I learn the system really well. Even though I'm only in for four years, I learn the system, become a federal prosecutor after that, then work for the NFL, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and the NBA, and I don't say any of this stuff to say, oh, look at me, it's not about me, it's about my mother, my queen every positive thing that's ever happened to me in my life is due to her. So when I'm in the back of that cruiser in Newport, all I can think about is her. She's going to be heartbroken. So now I'm begging the lieutenant, lieutenant, can you please tell me why am I here in the back of this cruiser cuffed? And he said, yeah, so here's the deal. He said, at the Marriott up the street, today we get this call that at 3.30 this afternoon at that Marriott, a black guy with a 9 millimeter in his hand goes up to a white guy at an event. He puts the 9 millimeter to the chest of the white guy, and he says, what you going to do now, white boy? And I was like, oh, this is going to be a long night. Because in Newport, and you've been there, some of you, ain't many people who look like me. I mean, that's just, I may have been the only one who looked like me that day, and I had a 9 millimeter on me. They got their guy. If I were them, I'd be like, yo, we got our guy. But it wasn't me. I didn't do that. So I, uh, I heard him say 3.30. I was like, 3.30? At 3.30, I wasn't even in the state of Rhode Island, let alone Newport. So I said to him, um, Lieutenant, I wasn't even in the state of Rhode Island at 3.30. Could you call my FBI office? They'll tell you where I was. I was actually with my special agent in charge at 3.30, debriefing him on a civil rights case that we just closed. Irony is very thick. The Keith Sumter case, you can look it up. It made national headlines. I was a case agent. And so I, uh, I debriefed him, and then at 3.30, I get my car. Uh, at 3.30, I have my meeting with him until 4.30. I get my car at 4.30, and I go up to... Newport. At 3.30, I wasn't in Newport. I said, can you call, speak to Milt Ulrich, my special agent in charge, 203-777-6311. He'll tell you where I was. They'll patch you through to his home. We didn't have cell phones the way we have them now. And he looked back at me, and it was like he saw a ghost. His face went flush. He, he said, I'm going to be right back. He steps out of the car, speaks to his people for about five minutes, comes back and says, Mr. Williams, we're going to take you out of the car. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. They take me out of the car, they put me on a curb, I'm still handcuffed, I'm seated. Places just going crazy with people, there's so many people. I said to the officer, I said, could you put me back in the car, everybody thinks I'm a criminal. He said, no, just stay here, we're trying to figure this out. Five more minutes goes by, another officer walks up to me, says, we're going to take the cuffs off you, is that okay? I was like, yes, that's a great thing. They take the cuffs off me, but please stay seated. We're still trying to figure this out. Another five minutes goes by and another officer walks up to me and he says, you can get up now, you can go now. We know you understand. And he walks away. And I just stood there. I can go now. I understand. Like what just happened to me was what I was thinking. Mr. Williams, can I help you up? Um, can you walk with me for like a minute? You know, man, you were extremely patient. What you went through, I know I would have probably been very upset. So we get this call that at 3.30, a black guy goes up to another guy with nine millimeter in his hand at the Marriott, and uh, he threatens him, and we see you walking across the street. We call you over. Within a minute, we find out you have a nine millimeter. We thought we had our guy. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your patience. We appreciate your courtesy. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please let us know. Here's my card. Here's my number. Here's my name. Call me whenever you need us. What would that take me, about 20 seconds? I didn't get my 20 seconds. And that's all I wanted. I would have arrested or detained me too that night. But I would have given me my 20 seconds as well. A lot of times when we talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, we talk about implicit bias, cultural awareness, anti-racism, all these words that we're hearing, 
Today is not about that. Today is about relationships. Substantive, successful, sustainable relationships. Meaningful relationships. If we build meaningful relationships, human being to human being, all those other things take care of themselves. So that's what we're talking about today. No tactics. I'm not a tactics guy. Like, I was in the FBI for three years, eight months. Like, you know more in your thumb, chief, than I know about tactics. This is about relationship building. And that's one thing I know a little bit about because I've learned from the best, my mother. My mother is the best relationship person I've ever met. We have friends for 50 years. If I would have gotten my 20 seconds, for 28 years, I would have had a different narrative about the Newport PD. 28 years. Great ROI. Return on investment, 20 seconds for 28 years. So whether it's 20 seconds, 20 months, 20 years, relationships will determine our destiny. And so that is what we're going to be talking about today. I thank you for having me. I appreciate being here in front of you. I'm honored by it. And what we're going to do now is we're going to consider one thing, one issue that I'd like to pose to you and those who are, who are at home. What is the most pressing issue of the day for law enforcement? From the perspective of law enforcement and then from the perspective of non-law enforcement, what is the most pressing issue? There are so many issues. There are, you know, we got a hundred of them. But what's the most pressing issue? For you, what keeps you up at night about this issue? Law enforcement, what is the thing that concerns you most? And same thing with non-law enforcement. I want you to consider that. And I want you to consider it as a group, small group, because we're going to break up into groups right now. Let's, uh, let's look at reporting out. And we're going to start with four. We're going to start with you. All right, so why don't you come on up here. You, the stage is yours. It's, the mic is yours. Um, could you just tell who you are and your affiliation, you know, resident, whatever, and then maybe everybody in, everybody in each group, just give us your name uh, for the police officers, your rank, how long you've been on, for everybody else, just your affiliation. Really quick, like three seconds, just so I know who's speaking. Joe McCabe uh, for Group 4. I am a Needham resident, a town meeting member, a recently retired psychiatrist. Um, and uh, we attempted to boil down what we talked about into one issue. It's hard to do. But uh, a lot of what the police uh, brought out, out is the difficulties with mental health issues in the town. Uh, and also there was discussion about issues about trust in the community, um, respect for property, respect for people, and fear, both on the part of police when they're coming, called into a situation. And, um, but I think we, we ended up focusing more on the importance of um, uh, communication, uh, the importance of uh, resources, uh, the police mentioned the uh, lack of mental health resources, uh, while at the same time focusing on the uh, presence of more uh, mental health consultation within the uh, police department, more work in the schools, and more training and crisis uh, team training with the police. So I think what we came up with is that a solution for a lot of these problems comes up in mostly areas of, uh, of uh, resources and training and uh, uh, 
and I think the fear is that the resources won't be there. May I, may I keep that? We can make a copy of it. We can. <laughs> you didn't even read it. Well, no, no, no. You're, I don't you, have you, legible handwriting well, as a doctor. Oh, I won't be able to. That's right. My mother said I should have been a doctor, but remember, I have that reading issue. So um, I can read this. It's, yeah, very, very well done, though. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Can everybody just, I want you to just tell us who you are quickly. I'm Roland Stern, retired elementary teacher. Thank you. I'm Jen Howard Schroeder from the Needham Human Rights Committee. Sean Bartle, new police officer with the town of Needham. Marianne Cooley, select board chair. James Wise, patrolman with Needham. RJ Poirier, school resource officer with Needham Police. Really appreciate that. And uh, you brought up quite a few issues that, and you said fear, that's a big issue. Um, fear, fearing the unknown is is a big part of that. Human being to human being, if we can appreciate a human being for a human being, perhaps we can alleviate some of that fear. I'll, uh, I'll speak to you briefly about that before we, before we go. Um, mental health issues, so resources. Are we prepared to put resources into that? That's the question. Usually after something happens, we are. Are we prepared to do it proactively? You have leaders in here who can help to move that along. So let's look at how we can do that proactively rather than reactively. We see the results when it's reactive. Uh, community trust. Community trust is built, it's not given. So that's something that has to be earned. And there are ways to do it. And I can, I can give you some of those tools. Uh, and I will give you some of those tools before we get out of here. Trust, healing, reconciliation. That's what we want. Ultimately, love. We want love between people. Love between people does away with all that stuff. Giving 20 seconds sometimes helps. If we give each other our 20 seconds, that's all it takes sometimes, we can build that start the process of building that trust. Thank you very much. This was great. I appreciate you for uh, being so in-depth. We're going to go with one. Thank you. I'm Ramin Abrishamian. I'm a long-time resident in Needham for about 35 years. Actually, our notes were taken by Officer Carroll, and, but she has very good handwriting, and I was volunteered we had five officers on the table to be the spokesperson. The topic that we zeroed in on was trust, both trust of the police officers and also the trust of the population. And we tried to address what solutions do we have to that idea of trust. And also the trust comes with fear as well. So uh, we talked about training, we talked about the fact that the fundamental building block is mutual trust. It has to be both ways. Police and residents meet frequently to work on trust. We've thought that that would be a solution to addressing the issue of trust. We said that if trust does not exist and they both fear one another, mistakes will happen. Being open and transparent and also taking time, that we felt that we need to take time and be patient with each other. And through time and outreach and training, try to create and build that trust. And this is uh, can, can just very quickly? from the Needham Human Rights Committee. Belinda Carroll, Lieutenant Needham Police. Katie McCullough, Police Officer for the Town of Needham. Joe Brienzi, Police Officer, Town of Needham. Uh, Peter O'Neill, 30-year resident and town meeting member. Dave Sherman, um, 25 or so year resident, ICU nurse. Matt Forbes, Lieutenant, Needham Police. John Schlittler, Police Chief. And thank you. And uh, I can go.
go in depth about how you build trust, one methodology for building trust. We have this curriculum that we call the recipe for reconciliation. It's proprietary, but we give it out to everybody because we want folks to have meaningful relationships. And the first step in that, rec that recipe for reconciliation, and um, we can, I don't know, you can put up that first slide, is without doing this one thing, we don't get to trust, healing, and reconciliation. Listening is the first step. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're just waiting to speak? That's not listening. We say listening and listening beautifully, listening to hearts, souls, and spirits, as opposed to just words. I am listening to your plight. I'm concerned about your plight because listening begets learning and learning begets understanding. Those are the first three ingredients in what we call the recipe for reconciliation. Listening, learning, and understanding. Listening begets learning, learning begets understanding. If we do those first three things properly, what happens? Empathy is born. I know what it's like to be in your shoes. You know what it's like to be in mine. And if we add action to empathy, we have compassion. I don't, not only know what it's like to be in your shoes, but I'm going to do something about your plight. Empathy plus action is compassion. Listening, learning, understanding. The fourth ingredient is acknowledging. We need to acknowledge where we came from, why we're here, why this situation exists. With law enforcement, it's pretty specific. If we look at our history, and this is something that I didn't even know about until I was schooled by another law enforcement officer. A lot of law enforcement officers ask why there are cer certain segments of society that have this generational distrust. We have to examine how law enforcement started in America. In America, law enforcement, especially in the South, Southeast, started with slave patrols. Now, you might say, why is that even relevant? Well, because there are grandparents telling grandkids, don't trust them back then, 300 years ago, 1704 in South Carolina. And those grandkids grow up to be grandparents, and then they tell their grandkids, don't trust them. For generations, there are grandparents telling grandkids, don't trust them. Might not have been any kind of action or activity that caused that distrust, but there is this generational distrust with some segments of society and we must acknowledge where we came from in order to reconcile because acknowledgement is such an important step. I'm not saying apologize. Law enforcement doesn't have to apologize for slave patrols because you, you weren't slave patrols. It happened in 1704. You don't even have to apologize for civil rights. What those officers, some of them were doing with dogs and fire hoses, no. But we have to acknowledge what happened. It's fact. And once we acknowledge it, perhaps we can understand why we're here. Remember, the relevance is that grandparents were telling their grandkids. And it's passed down through the generations. And then that acknowledgement should lead to action, because people are just discussing this issue for decades and centuries. There's no action. Everybody right now who's protesting wants action. So what's the action? We say the action looks like a house of action. And if you know what a house looks like, you have a foundation for a house. I don't know if you can hit that next slide. Um, this, this, a house has a foundation, a strong foundation keeps a house sustainable. Without a foundation, a house will be a house of cards. The house of action for us to get to meaningful relationships. This is substantive, successful, sustainable relationships we're trying to create. That foundation is based in humility and open-mindedness. When I'm going to have a relationship with somebody and I want it to be meaningful, I have to walk into that relationship open-minded, willing to learn, leaving my ego at the door. Humility and open-mindedness. And then on top of that foundation, you erect five pillars. And these five pillars, this is what relationship building is all about right here. Vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. Vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. I can tell you, nobody knew that I couldn't read. 
because I didn't tell anybody. I went through most of my life not being able to read really well. I could read phonetically very well, so people thought I was a good reader, but I couldn't really understand what I was reading. I never told anybody. Nobody knew that I was on welfare for the first 17 years of my life. They didn't know that I had all this shame because people were calling me names when I was a kid, and I carried the shame for most of my life. Nobody knew. They thought I was something else because I was pretending. I was faking my way through my life. And then one day I said, it's, it's affecting every relationship I have to fake my way through life. So I decided I was just going to be transparent with people. I'm going to let them know how I am, who I am. And that's what I did. I told a couple of friends who I really am that I wasn't the most brilliant guy in the world. They thought I was brilliant for some reason, but I was. And I couldn't even read well. And so they thought I also grew up in a middle class family, but I grew up in poverty <laughs> on welfare. I was ashamed of it. I was embarrassed by it all. And I just decided to relieve myself of the shame. And I told them, this is who I really am. And they didn't judge me. They were my friends. So they, they, um, they were really pretty happy that I told them who I really was and congratulated me. And at that point, I got confident. So I started telling more people. Before I knew it, I was telling thousands of people from a stage, this is who I am. And my law school got wind of this, and they asked me if I would just speak to 300 prospective law students one day and their parents and tell my story. It had nothing to do with law school, but it had everything to do with inspiration. And they said, if you tell this story to these 300 prospective law students and their families, you may get a few of them that come here. And these were the best law students in New York. And I did that, and I told my story. And afterwards, a young Latina woman walked up to me, and she said, Mr. Williams, your story is my story. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, your story is my story. I'm poor. I'm embarrassed. My family's on welfare. I don't tell anybody about this. I've been hiding it for my whole life. She said, I'm 21 years old. I'm a 4.0 law student, uh, undergraduate student right now. I can go to any law school in the nation for free. But I'm not free, Mr. Williams, she said, until today. Because you just gave me permission to tell my story. The reason why she got her freedom was because I made a very deliberate decision in my life to be vulnerable and to relieve myself of the pain I had. She was in such pain currently. That pain she associated, it connected to my childhood pain. If you want to know how to form meaningful relationships in life, if you learn nothing else from tonight from your peers or me, I got one word for you. Pain. Pain. Every meaningful relationship has pain in it. Whether it's the revelation of pain, the acceptance of pain, or the connection to pain. Pain is the connective tissue for human beings. And then you have courage, purpose, and power. Courage to be creative with your relationships, to be vulnerable. That's courage. Purpose, knowing your why. Everybody in here knows they have a why. You may not have found it yet, but when you find it, never forget it. Law enforcement officers, highest level why, you save lives. Never forget that. Sometimes the job can get to you and you forget. And then power. The, the, the ability to create surrogacy is the most efficient use of power. So it's not the chief telling the world he loves them. He's here to protect and serve. He has people who love him in the community telling the community they love us. That's surrogacy. It's the highest level of efficient use of power because now it's exponential what's happening in the community. It's not just one person saying it. It's the community saying it. If you do the first five things with the recipe for reconciliation that I told you about, listening, learning, understanding, acknowledging, and then taking action, with vulnerability, courage, purpose, power, and pain. If you do that stuff, trust, healing, reconciliation happens automatically, organically, without you even trying because you did the work. A lot of people say trust. Like, how do we get to trust? I'm telling you, if you just listen, learn, understand, acknowledge, and take action with that vulnerability and the revelation and acceptance of pain, trust is going to happen. But you got to do it every day. It's simple, but it ain't easy. 
I needed to give you that. I know it's gonna, it took a little bit of time, but I needed to give you that because I'm sure more than one group said trust is an issue. How do we get to trust? That's how we get to trust. We can give you these slides. We can give you materials on that so that you can take it home, and I'm gonna be here for you whenever you need me. Let's, we, we, we are already over, but let's quickly go to group number, that's two, right? Three, let's go to two, right? Let's go to, see, I told you, I forget my number like when, so yeah, let's go there really quick. Let's do this, let's do this as efficiently as possible. There's a game, so I'm trying to be respectful, but this is important too, so here you go. Officer Anthony Frangillo with the Needham Police Department. Group two, our group did it a little bit differently. Uh, it was a little bit, uh, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability, right? People kind of laid out what their biggest fears are. And then we tried to look at that holistically and how we can assuage some of that anguish through what we do and through what the community does. So we looked at uh, five or six issues. The first is homophobia and transphobia in policing. The second is uh, right-wing white supremacy. Third is mental health and mental health crises. The fourth is how to relate to the BIPOC community. The fifth is fractured relationships between the police and the community. The sixth is for the police, having a uh, broad brush to be painted with based on the actions of a few. And the seventh is leadership, how to lead the next generation of police officers. So within those seven aspects, we tried to figure out what can be applied and what are some of the fundamentals for both sides of the aisle. And really it came down to communication and resources. And within that communication, relationship building. Within re relationship building, we kind of looked at training. Both training through real life case studies and developing hands-on activities for both sides. And really teaching black American history to police officers so they understand the past and they can understand the future as a result. We talked about recruitment, new officers, leaving civil service, how that'll affect it. Looked at the education and the process of educating new officers. And we looked at the fact that relationships are two-way streets. That there's a relationship on our end and there's a relationship on the community's end as well. And so being able to approach us and have a conversation with us is just as important as the trainings that we go to and the learning that we do. Certainly. Chris, Chris Baker, Deputy Chief of the Police Department. Marlene Schultz, a Needham Human Rights Committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Georgina Arietta Rutnick. Lots of different things in Needham. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Liz Lee, School Committee. Rebecca Young, Town Meeting Member and Needham Diversity Initiative Board Member. Chad Williams, 10-year Needham resident. Uh, Michael Lamb, Sergeant, Needham Police Department. Marcus Nelson, uh, Vice Chair of the Select Board. And I just want to add one more thing. Um, what was also touched upon is who our police officers are before they put on the uniform and who they are after they put on the uniform when they take it off. And I think that's important as well to kind of realize that more than anything, they are another human being and putting on the uniform with great pride is really important, but who you are before you put it on every day and in your social circles and who you are after you take it off is extremely important too because you know you have a job to do, but in the end, we're the same. Uh, Doug Fox, Needham resident for 38 years with a gap in between and town meeting member. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent trust. I've heard, I heard trust again, but did you notice that like five, of, five or six of the solution-based things, relationship, relationships, better relationships, how do we treat human beings like human beings? This is that simple. We look for all these ways to do this stuff, and it seems so complicated. It's not something that's complicated, it's complex complex because we're dealing with egos and behavior, but it's not complicated. It's very simple. Thank you very much. 
I appreciate that. Relationships, we have, I, I know, I'm, I'm, coming to the, I'm coming to the cleanup. I'm coming to the cleanup. I, but we also have, there's somebody up there. So come on up here. Uh, we have group three. Thank you. Group two, excellent. High standards have been set here, one, two, and four. So let's go. Thank you. I'm Jen Shek Khan. I'm a town meeting member. Um, I do work with Needham CPAC and a bunch of other organizations. So uh, you're kind of a hard act to follow here. Our, our basic, it's them, but then a lot of the things that you'd said before or what we talked about. Um, so our main focus was how to build trust between the police and the community. Um, and so we talked about the solutions being relationship building with residents. Um, and non-residents um, who work, visit, and go to school in Needham. And our solution is really more face-to-face -face interactions, um, like more walk, walk and talks, walks and talks. Oh, thanks. Um, so basically police um, you know, interacting with community members um, as they currently do. And then we also thought about using some existing programs um, as a model, like the SRO program where Police officers get to know kids very well as their ways of, of replicating that opportunity for other parts of the population. Um, you know, coffee with cops, um, perhaps invite police officers to block parties so we can kind of get to know each other a little bit better. We also talked about a solution in, begins with acknowledging that different communities have different relationships with police officers and acknowledging the historical fear of BIPOC people in particular. Um, and we thought that police officers could approach existing groups in town, like Stronger Together and the Resilience Network, and try to um, kind of get to know people in these, organ in these groups. We also talked about the idea of creating a public safety board that would be more of a, like a proactive opportunity where um, citizens or um, you know, re residents or non-residents in Needham and police officers could kind of come together and talk about training, could talk about education, just sort of proactively kind of get to know each other um, and not necessarily talk about cases or things that are happening, but just kind of start to build a connection. No, I, th I think I was just double checking. Did I miss anything? Well, great. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Smriti Rao, and I am a 15 year Needham resident, and I do work with equal justice in Needham. Amelia Klein, Human Rights Committee and Needham Diversity Initiative. I'm Austin Broderick, Patrol Officer, Needham Police Department. Uh, Joe O'Brien, Detective Sergeant with the Police Department. Kate Fitzpatrick, town manager. Joanne Allen will be a director of the MECO program for the district. Cynthia Ganung, I'm on the Needham Diversity Initiative, the Human Rights Committee, the Clergy Association, Immigration Task Force, most of which I'm missing tonight because this is really important. That's so nice of you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Um, trust and relationships. I heard that. Relationships, relationships. Rela so when, when you have a coffee with a cop for the officers, it's how you show up. It's not the event, it's how you show up. That's what we talk about, the vulnerability. Being judicious in, with your vulnerability. You're not gonna give your home address, although everybody probably knows in this town, everybody knows where everybody lives. You're gonna be judicious with your vulnerability, but you're gonna be vulnerable in a way so that folks aren't looking, you like, uh, looking at you like robots because there are people who believe some cops are robots. You just pull people over, you ask for the license and registration, and you give them a ticket or you don't, and that's what you do. They don't know that you're, as we were talking about, that you're human beings, that you coach, that you, you like to garden, that you have hobbies. When folks know that, they look at you differently. It's hard to hate up close. It's easy to hate from afar. So, yes, yes. We have, so we have the, the last group of three or four? There's two groups. Oh, there's two groups? Okay, so. Raise the, the spokesperson could raise their hand and I could. Yep, if, so if, uh, if we can hear from the spokesperson, the, the first group. Unmute. Are you talking about the remote people? Yep, go ahead, you can go. Yes, the remote people. 
Okay, I'm Penny Kirk. I'm a 20 year resident. Uh, I'm on the board of the Needham Housing Authority and a bunch of other um, organizations I'm involved with. I've decided to make a summary and just uh, have uh, bullet points because this is taking quite a while and I have five pages of notes because people were very uh, loquacious, I guess is the word. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some bullet points. Um, of concern, cooperation, partnership, address guns, respect for disabilities, understand the other side, fear on both sides, build relationships with the high school kids, try to understand what each side is going through, and I'm talking about police and civilians, training and more staff, Work on chances to relate, take ownership for events, good and bad, reassess, look back at events, understand the possibilities of danger for police, and share humanity between both groups. Thank you. We're going to go to the next group, too. That was great. And, and there's some relationship basis for many of those as well. Human being to human beings, this is what it's about. It's about being human beings. Can we get from the next group? Just in the, uh, just looking at the time, we want to make sure that we're respectful. Thank you so much. The next group, does it have a, uh, is that it? Okay. All right, maybe not. All righty. So we have five groups. Oh, well, is there anybody? Nope. All right. So, yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Uh, are they going to be able to introduce themselves all? Um, Will they be I able think to? It's going to be really challenging. That's going to be challenging. Yeah. And, you know, and just thinking about the time. Thank you for sitting through uh, remotely. That's, I, and I'm glad that you took five pages of notes. Really appreciate that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end this thing. We're already 15 minutes over, but I need this to happen because we've been discussing these issues for decades, if not centuries, like I said earlier. And discussion's not good enough. We need action. We need to have solutions. This is about solutions. You came up with some solutions, but those solutions can seem so grandiose. It can seem so nebulous, too, like, how are we going to accomplish that? Because it takes time. These are long-term strategies that you were laying out. All right, so I'm going to break it down for you and make it a little bit simpler. What can you do as soon as you leave tonight to change the dynamic with just one person in your life, either in your life now or somebody who will be in your life tomorrow? What can you do? Let's take away, I have to save the world. One person, what can you do to change the dynamic with one person? Something simple, very simple. I can tell you what we get when we are in sessions like this. We get, well, I'm going to look somebody in the eye and I'm going to say hello to them. And I, don't, I won't even know them. Just going to maybe buy coffee for somebody who's online behind me. I always say do it at Dunkin' Donuts, not Starbucks. I don't know what the prices are here at Starbucks. It's like four times more expensive at Starbucks. Some, some people, some of the officers will say, I'm going to roll down my windows so that people can see me, even though it might be a little hot. I'm going to get out of my car more often. I'm going to be very intentional with it, they say. Even though they do that already, they're going to do it more. So what is the one thing as a human being that you can do to change the dynamic with just one person? One person it will take you five seconds. We'll go five seconds. This should take like three minutes to do this. Everybody gives that one thing. I could tell you the one thing I did in my life. So words are very important to me. You know how I feel about words because I am not, I have this reading deficit. Well, there's a word that I don't use in my family. And I don't use that word and my kids don't use that word. And they used it once when they were two. Each of them used it. And as soon as they used it, I corrected them and they never used it again. 
And if I say the word even in context of quoting somebody or something, my daughter, who's eight, going on 38, she'll walk up to me and she'll say, Daddy, come here. You said that word, apologize. And I'll be like, what did I do? Oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, baby, I said it. I won't do it again. The word is can't. My family doesn't use the word can't. My kids believe that they can do anything in the world. They're eight and nine because I took can't out of the vo their vocabulary. It's all about can for them. There's another word I don't use, and it's because of that history that we have. And we use it a lot in the law enforcement industry. We use it every day. We've probably used it in this setting right here. It's a, it's a word that communities have told me for about a decade. Stop using that word. It means something different to us than you intend. The word is policing. I don't use the word policing anymore. I don't use it. I replaced it with serving. Law enforcement officers, you don't police, you serve. You serve at the highest level. I am policing their community versus I am serving our community. I changed two words in that sentence. It means the world to those who are receiving that. You know the history. Policing meant something different. What's the one thing? That's the one thing I did. I took one word out of my vocabulary. It's that simple. What's the one thing you can do to change the dynamic with just one person? Let's start here. And it, remember, this is two seconds, because we got to get people out of here. <laughs> listen. listen. Listen beautifully. And you, and you can use the same one, too. Listen. Yes. Three nice things every day with somebody. That's, that's great. That's incredible. Thank you. 20 seconds. It's that simple. Yes. Listen. Listen beautifully. Empathy. Not saying you don't have this, you're not already doing this stuff, but you're more intentional now. You're more deliberate. You're doing it with purpose. Yes. Try to follow up. Oh, oh, action. Action. Attach action to... Yes. Actually do something. Yes. Thank you. Listen. Listen beautifully, Chief. Treat people with respect. You already do it. But now, on that day when you just don't feel like having anybody in your face, maybe you're more deliberate about it. We all have those days. We're human. Acknowledge. Acknowledge people. Acknowledge, oh, it's a big deal when you look somebody in the eye. Yes. Honor humanity. You already do that. But now, maybe just a twinge higher, right? Yes. Yes. Reach out to somebody who you had given up on. Yes. It's big. You might save somebody's life. Find a way to relate, even with the differences, right? Yep. Officer. Listen, learn, understand, listen beautifully. Yes. Persevere. Life is challenging. Yes, ma'am. Sorry when it's, when it's appropriate. Yes. That's not a weakness. It's a strength. Yes. Gift of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, remember. Yes. Be patient. We all have. It's a fast, fast world. We have to be very intentional with that. Yes. Have conversations. Yes. Absolutely. Give people their time. Yes, Sergeant. Follow up. That's a big one for police officers. People don't expect it. When you show up a week later after there's been a domestic or something, you're making sure somebody's okay, they're shocked. And it's big. Yes. Not being afraid. It's not a weakness. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's easy to get caught up in glass half, half empty. But stay, keep it half full. Thank you. Smile, have a conversation, and listen. The smile thing, you don't even have to break stride. That's that simple. Thank you. Uh, did, you did you go? No. Be open. Be open. Yeah, open-mindedness, right. Acknowledge when something good has been done by somebody. Yes. Pray for people. He said particularly those who he doesn't necessarily like. But praying for people, that's great. Yes. 
Challenge your assumptions, yes. Open-mindedness, yes. Empathy, that's, that's all about empathy. Put yourself in their shoes. Do your best to understand where somebody's coming from, yes. Take a deep breath and be generous. It might only be 20 seconds that you have to give, right? Empathy. Be present. I take my phone off the table when I'm at dinner. That helps. Keep it in my back pocket. That's more. And you're already doing that, but we have to find new ways to do it. Inspire, inspiring that hope, right? So who do, you, who do you trust most in your life, officer? Living person. Your father? Who do you trust most in life? You're a living person. Husband. Probably, she said. Okay. <laughs> I'm just repeating. I'm just repeating. I'm not, don't hold it against me. I'm just messing with you. Uh, who, do, who, do you who do you trust most in life? Father, father, who do you trust most in life? Husband, who do you trust most in life? Wife, here's what I'm going to ask you as a final thing. You just told the world what you're going to do. You did. You told the world that you're going to do these things to change the dynamic with one person. I want you to text or email the person you trust the most, a living person, and tell her or him what you told the world, that you're going to do this. I guarantee you, in most cases, in two to four weeks, they're going to ask you, did you, do, did you do what you told me you were going to do? We have to be accountable. If we say we're going to do something, we have to have accountability for it. So when you leave here, there's a tendency to forget what happened here and leave it in here. No, you got to take it out there. You said you're going to change the dynamic with one person. Change that dynamic. Hold yourself accountable. I thank you for having me. God bless you. We went way over. <laughs> and if you need me, I'm here. I have deep, a deep appreciation for what the chief has done, what your town manager who I just met is doing, and what Katie, your assistant town manager, and what all you are doing as leaders. This is how the world changes, one person at a time. Thank you and God bless you.